Charles Condamine bitterly finds that a six-shooter gun lying around in his room is much easier to use than the typewriter in front of him. He's a writer, clashing his way to organize words inside his head, but the words won't come. So, Charles turns to music and drinking to soothe his anxiety and maybe seek out even a little flicker of ideas. His wife, Ruth, is woken up by the music. She makes her way toward the building where Charles temporarily stays, and with her thin and high-pitched voice, she makes him quit scaring off birds in the area. Then, we follow Edith, their servant, through their usual morning routine. As she enters Charles's room, she discovers him bargaining with some higher entity. When all the other methods prove useless, the only thing left to ask for is divine intervention. However, the divines are silent, so the typewriter ends up in the air, hitting the statue in front of the building. Ruth's peaceful conversation is interrupted, so she takes the head of the statue and goes up to his room. Charles is sitting by the window, desperate and weak. When Ruth comes in, he swiftly hides something behind his back. From their conversation, we find out that he must write a 90-page script for a movie. He has already written the story. Now he only needs to adapt it for the cinema. It's an easy and simple job from Ruth's perspective. And besides, she's tired of living in the real world alone while her husband dwells in the imaginary space he created for himself. It seems like they are about to have a sweet moment, but the thing Charles was hiding falls on the floor, and the chance is ruined. It's a photo of Charles's late wife, Elvira, who passed away. The man clumsily tries to justify himself, but Ruth interrupts and assures him that she's not at all jealous. However, in the next scene, as she's playing tennis with her friend, Violet Bradman, we understand how much she was lying. She's upset that the woman who is long gone still manages to oppose her from the other dimension. Violet proposes a simple way out, she should let the man be shackled by his words and find someone else to warm her bed. Meanwhile, Charles is talking with Dr. Bradman. He shares his struggles, which are more than just writing and work. It seems like he's struggling in bed as well. He is given a remedy, a medicine, amphetamine. That will surely help him overcome that type of anxiety too. Charles is a little bit cautious at first, asking if taking it can grow into a habit. But the man assures him otherwise, he's been taking it for years. Charles can be sure that it won't be addicting. They go to a theater later that night. It is a medium show, and even their servants are there to watch magic play out on the stage. Is there life after death? That is the main theme of the event. The murmurs fade as an older woman appears in front of a huge moon. In talking about her journey around the globe, she states that she broke through to the other side of living and mapped the paths that led there. Suddenly, when she starts levitating in the air, the whole building gasps in astonishment, including Charles and his friends, who boast how skeptical they are about this mummer's show. The magician has the attention and trust of the crowd, but her performance stops abruptly when the mechanism holding her up in the air breaks. She falls to the ground and through the stage. Now everybody's sure that the trickster failed to carry out her performance, that she is a fraud, and that nothing real is in her magic. When Charles's friends look back to address him, they discover that he's gone. We follow him though, and see him sneaking up to the magician's room and lightly knocking on the door. Madame Arcadi doesn't invite him in, but he slowly moves inside nonetheless, saying that he's a writer of crime novels and screenplays and a believer. He's sure that her abilities are inhuman, and the woman is immediately captured by his warm words. Everybody always expects her to do miracles day and night, and that is not how the mysteries of the world work. They manifest themselves on their own accord, she's merely a mediator. Now Charles has the chance to carry out the mission he set out for himself. He offers her to conduct a private seance in his home, where quite a few influential people will be gathered. This will be an opportunity to come back from today's failure. And so she agrees to do it this Thursday and seems quite excited about that day. Later, however, when Charles comes out of the heater with Ruth, we understand that he was only pretending to be a believer. He lured the woman into his home to conduct a secret ceremony, only to include it in his script. The things that he will learn this Thursday will help him make his character truly unique. Ruth gets interested in who this character is, and Charles replies that he's deceased, a victim of a terrible crime, and he communicates through the medium to help solve the crime. He's extremely grasped and mesmerized by his idea, however, Ruth seems to only be interested in the time in which the script will be finished. Her father has already threatened to find a new writer. Thursday night is black and ominous. Thunderstorms rage outside while the ceremony is about to begin. The Bradmans and the Condamines lay their hands on the table while Madame Arcadi channels her spirit guide, Maya. She asks her questions and gets answers from the raps on the table. Mr. Bradman seems quite amused by this and makes a joke, but for the ceremony to be complete, none of the gathered should be skeptical. And so, Tutankhamun's wet nurse, Maya, is asked whether there are any souls in this house and who she wants to speak with. At first, the way Arcadi speaks in Arabic seems to be extremely fun for all of them. Arcadi herself seems to understand and even be used to this, but she knows how real the Maya and the channeling to the other side are. And so, after a series of questions and raps, she understands that there is a soul in this house who wants to speak with Charles. However, Charles has no idea who it might be. 
And when Madame Arcati asks him if there is anyone on the other side that is on his mind often, he denies it not to upset Ruth. There is no other way, Arcati must go into a trance. She puts on music that suddenly and weirdly reminds Charles of his late wife. And the music starts, while thunderclaps rage in the distance outside. Unexpectedly, Arcati starts to behave oddly. She closes up her mouth as if not to let something out. And once she can hold on no longer, she screams terribly and falls unconscious. The electricity shuts down, thunder grumbles outside, and a gust of wind blows open the windows with a terrible crash. It's dark now, and nothing is funny anymore. The men try to close the doors and start explaining the series of events with the help of logic. Then Dr. Bradman approaches Arcadi, flicks his fingers, and suddenly, the lights and the woman are back simultaneously. The woman stands up briskly and states that she feels something otherworldly in her chakra. A great change has taken place. She asks if they said anything supernatural while she was in the trance, but they didn't see anything strange apart from suddenly opened windows. And so, after apologizing that nothing of great significance manifested itself today, Madame Arcadi leaves, and once she's gone, the laughter they were holding in for so long bursts out fiercely. Once Madame Arcadi goes to bed, however, she finds nothing amusing. She has never felt the way she felt this evening. She sighs deeply and tells her deceased husband that something tremendous has happened. Meanwhile, Charles is in a delightful mood. He walks to his bed and chats amiably with Ruth, but the latter won't let him sleep when the ideas are raging in his head. If he has gotten a great deal of material out of that woman, then he should go down and write it down immediately. And so he yields, walks down, turns off the music that still fills the living room, and fixes himself a drink. Suddenly, thunder hits the house, lights flicker, and the sky roars. He cannot believe his eyes when a translucent light in front of him gradually takes form. His ex-wife, Elvira, is standing in front of him, emanating an electrical buzz and looking around in disgust. Frustrated, she calls out to Charles, scolding him for the new terrible decor. Charles is dumbfounded. He was the one who was extremely skeptical of the old woman. How could this happen? With wide eyes and a gaze full of fear, he sees how Elvira scans the rooms, grieving her old stuff and design. After a while, Charles understands something. Elvira thinks that she's been gone for only a weekend. The memory of death has vanished from her brain. There's no other way, he must tell her. But first, Elvira sees the scarf that belongs to Ruth, and suddenly, she's sure that Charles is cheating. Naturally, Charles starts telling her the truth clumsily and evasively, but Elvira demands he says it plainly, so he gives it to her. She's dead. Once the words leave his mouth, he sees a slap coming toward his cheek, but it never touches the flesh. And so, anger turns to t as Elvira realizes that she's no longer part of the living world. The screaming wakes Ruth up. She starts walking downstairs while Charles tells Elvira the story of her passing. She was competing in a tournament, but the conditions were terrible. She should have walked off, but eventually, she paid for her stubbornness. After hearing that she might be a ghost, Elvira starts sobbing loudly, and Charles, afraid that Ruth might hear, asks her to stop being so hysterical. But this is the exact moment Ruth walks in. Naturally, she can neither feel nor see Elvira, so she assumes that Charles was addressing her. She scolds him for being such a procrastinator, and after her brief speech, Elvira gets interested in who that woman is. After that, Charles has a hilarious conversation with two of his wives, one of whom cannot see the other. Finally, Charles tells Ruth that Elvira is in the room. He even introduces them to one another, explaining that Arcadi must have summoned her during the seance. Ruth has had enough of this nonsense. She starts walking off when Elvira remarks that, finally, they can have some private time. Charles replies to her insolence accordingly. But once more, Ruth thinks that he's talking to her. She turns back enraged, and after she's done pouring her anger out, Elvira concludes that this marriage must have been of convenience, and Charles is finally assured that he's gone mad. The next morning, Ruth is still angry at him. Whatever the reason, it's evident that Charles is still clinging to his first marriage. She throws those accusations at him while Dr. Bradman checks his blood pressure. Finally, he advises him to quit consuming those pills. They might have had something to do with that intense hallucination. Right away, relieved by the thought that he hasn't gone mad, he apologizes to Ruth and makes up with her. She's quick to forgive everything, and they both walk toward the car to go to Ruth's father, who works at Pinewood Studio. Charles wants to get his opinion first before committing to his idea. Ruth's father seems to like his idea, but not so much as to wait six months for it. Therefore, Charles vows to finish it in a few weeks. And so they all go to watch the shooting of some scene. As they make their way into the shooting site, a fan of Charles's introduces the leading actress to him. She asks him a few questions about his work and gets all the answers from Ruth instead of Charles. Finally, she gets interested in whether there's any woman behind all his willful female characters. Ruth answers this one as well, but suddenly, Elvira slides into Charles's view, urging him to say the truth, say that all his characters are based on her personality. Charles does his best to contain himself at first, but eventually, he fails to remain quiet and smile. He hisses at Elvira, calling her vain and self-obsessed. He draws back and falls. Ruth asks him to go home and lie down, but he's not so eager to sleep in the afternoon. 
Then Elvira once again intervenes in the conversation, and after a series of insults directed at his ex-wife, he gets punched in the face. Ruth hastily takes him home. Once they arrive, she urges him to get on with work and start delivering a splendid text to prove his sanity, or she'll have to call the doctor. In the next scene, we see Madame Arcati trying to call upon the soul of her deceased husband, Donald. We finally understand why she started honing her spiritual abilities. All she wants is to see her husband once more. But the years of working on herself still don't allow her to do so. The next morning, Charles struggles to start writing. Working on screenplays is dreadful for him. It was much easier to write novels, and he was quite successful at them as well. Suddenly, Elvira appears in front of him again. And as they talk, Edith sees him talking to the air, and rushes to Ruth. She has had enough. In the next scene, she's about to bring him to a sanatorium. Charles is desperate. He tries to convince her that Elvira has crossed over from the other side and is sitting by the piano right now but to no avail. So there's nothing else to do but urge Elvira to somehow manifest herself. And so Elvira starts playing the piano. Ruth frowns. Terrified, she tries to deny that her house is haunted by a ghost and runs into another room. Elvira is already there. This time she takes lipstick and draws over Ruth's portrait with it. This time, Ruth is finally convinced. Terrified, she cries her lungs out and bolts out of the room. Later that afternoon, she visits Madame Arcati, who's about to move out. She tells her everything. How her husband's deceased wife has returned and how Charles can see her and talk to her. For Arcati, it's great news. Finally, her work has paid off. It must mean that her abilities have grown exceptional. But that news is not, by any stretch of the imagination, gladdening for Ruth. And if the events that have happened so far aren't enough, Madame Arcati tells her that the reason for this manifestation is the emotional connection that's still strong between Charles and Elvira. Soon, if the ghost feels welcome, she will be able to fully materialize. Back home, Charles is frustrated trying to find Ruth, but nobody seems to know where she went. This is an opportunity for Elvira, so she seizes it and tries to seduce him, forcing him to remember their past and imagine their future. Finally, she offers to take a boat out, but Charles needs to write. Elvira won't be fooled so easily. She knows why Charles is struggling to write even a single page. It's because she's not with him anymore. And so, in the following scene, we see them on a boat. Somehow, as if it were her adaptation, Elvira tells Charles about everything that is wrong with his piece and proposes all the solutions for him. Charles never even thought about the ideas that Elvira puts forward so easily and effortlessly. Finally, we understand that Elvira has always been the bright mind behind the novels, while Charles was merely a writer, a hand that held the pen. Back to Ruth and Arcadi, the woman finally yields and openly admits that she has no idea how to undo what has been done. She tries to justify herself to Ruth, saying that had she known that Charles was so eager to communicate with his dead ex-wife, she would have consulted with her first. Ruth suddenly feels the urge to protect her and her husband's honor. And so she tells her why Charles called her and asked her to hold the seance. This angers Madame Arcadi, but Ruth manages to calm her down and finally even assures her to stay here and not move out. Therefore, Arcadi won't move out anymore, while Ruth will cover all her expenses. Meanwhile, Charles and Elvira are writing together. Line by line, Elvira manages to grasp Charles's soul. We see his face, mesmerized and almost drunk. They lean closer and closer until they are about to kiss, and there's nothing Charles's poor willpower can do. But abruptly, Elvira gets back and persuades Charles to go out for a drink. And so, in the following scene, they are sitting by the bar. For the serving man, it is quite a unique sight, a man buying a drink for a space beside him. Charles knows that Elvira wants something. Every time she was so undeniably tempting, she wanted something. It seems like the only thing Elvira wants is to be alone with him. These words struck some long-forgotten and mysterious chord in Charles's heart. With the help of some overwhelming force, he admits that he failed to get over her death. And he loves Ruth, but his love for Elvira is somehow different. Suddenly, Elvira takes his hand, and we see them touch, trembling and surprised. Ruth must be feeling that something is off. Sitting sleepless by the stairs in the morning, she looks at the pictures of two marriages, comparing them with eyes full of sorrow. But the anger swiftly domesticates her eyes once she sees Charles's car drifting into their yard. The thing that infuriates her is that Charles is sitting in the passenger seat while the car is driven by some invisible force. Ruth knows who it is, so she goes down, shouts it, and scolds Charles, who admits that Elvira helped him write the first act of his screenplay. This enraged Ruth even more, she points to a space where Elvira must be in enraged. She makes it clear to her that Madame Arcadi will soon banish her from the world of the living. Finally, she runs away, sulking, so Charles follows her. From another side of the barred door, he manages to win her trust back by promising her an extraordinary life in Hollywood. Elvira will merely help them become successful faster. Ruth really shouldn't be jealous. He lies and says that he can't even touch Elvira, and besides, Ruth is the only one he ever wants to touch. And by that, anger leaves Ruth, and their lips touch passionately. That exact morning, after hearing about Arcadi's intentions, Elvira went to her mansion. Lying beside her, the ghost says that there's no way she leaves this world, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. 
Naturally, Arkady can't hear her, so Elvira uses some other methods to threaten her and scare her away until, finally, the old lady understands that the ghost of Elvira will haunt her forever if she continues to meddle in her affairs. We understand that Elvira truly turned to violence after she threatened Charles in his bed as well. She won't just swing and swirl around the house, singing words for Charles's screenplay, while the latter sleeps with and makes love to Ruth. The flash of that comes with her words leaves Charles later that morning when Ruth's father calls. It seems like an extremely popular and successful actress is going to act in his film. Charles is delighted. Loudly, he expresses his overwhelming happiness that an actress of such caliber will speak his words. Elvira hears this, of course. His husband is sleeping with some stranger who tries to banish her from this world. He expresses his love for this woman, and if that isn't enough, now he uses her wits and talent to write screenplays. Elvira's fuming with rage. It's not fair. And so she starts by throwing Charles and Ruth's wedding gifts away and ends by ruining their garden. Ruth and the garden judges discover it suddenly, the garden has turned into hideous chaos. This has to stop somehow. In the next scene, we see Madame Arcadia as she enters the quarters of London's spiritual alliance. She meets with the national director, who doesn't believe a single word she says and calls her a fraud. Finally, he asks his assistant, Margaret, to see Madame Arcadia out. And so, Arcadi is desperate, however, to her surprise, just before the door is closed, Margaret tells her to meet up in an hour at the Temple Square. There, in secret, she provides Arcadi with a banishing spell and tells her all about the materials that she'll need. Back to Charles, the chaos in the garden is resolved, and people are gathered to party. The afternoon is delightful, and conversations are warm and steady, however, it will not go on for so long. Suddenly, Elvira slips out the amphetamine from Dr. Bradman's pocket, and pours a few drops into Ruth's drink. Then Charles proposes a wonderful toast to true love until chaos begins unfolding gradually. In the following scene, we see Ruth in the living room dancing restlessly. She feels unusually hot, so she takes off her dress and goes to the swimming pool, in a great mood and unable to stop dancing. All eyes turn to her in an instant, some ashamed, some amused, and some confused, until Charles manages to take her out, proposing to lie down. Ruth is eager to lie down, yes, but only if Charles joins in. They enter their bedroom and lie down energetically and passionately, but naturally, Elvira isn't eager to let them do it. She swiftly opens the curtains, making it evident that she's here and looking. Ruth is now made to direct all her energy to scream and hate. She shames and scolds Elvira for trying to steal her house and her husband. Finally, Charles assures her that Elvira apologized and went away. He's hoping to continue making love to her, but Ruth is no longer in a mood. However, Elvira is, and all the willpower quickly leaves Charles as she pushes him down on the bed. The next morning, all the memories of the party seem to vanish from Ruth's memory. She and Charles are sitting in a dining room. The man seems shattered and restless. He feels guilty and splits, however, their conversation is still pleasant until they hear screaming coming from the kitchen, where Elvira is toying with their servant, throwing knives at her. When the couple arrives, they see the cook, named Edna, running away from the house, screaming that this place is cursed. Ruth runs after her, but the woman is scared to the bone. Then, Madame Arcadi goes to her village to prepare the spell, while Charles's work continues as usual. Elvira throws the words around while he catches them and puts them on the paper. After a while, Charles types the last few sentences, changes the ending to his liking, and the screenplay is finished. Charles is extremely delighted. He's sure that the film will be even better than the novel. He's so eager to tell all this to Ruth as soon as possible, but for some reason, Elvira urges him to keep it a secret for a little while. In the next scene, we see how tormenting it is to be a housewife for Ruth. As she takes the burned dish out of the oven, Charles walks in. In their brief conversation, he does as Elvira bids him, hiding away the fact that his script is finished. Finally, Ruth proposes that they join their beds again. They spend their days separated, but this way they will at least be a man and a wife at night. Afraid to seem hesitant, Charles agrees abruptly and leaves for a walk to clear his head. However, clearing your mind is tough when a ghost is trying to win back your life at the same time. Walking beneath the trees near the lake, they come across a huge elk. It surely senses the presence of Elvira and isn't afraid of her. The magnificence of the animal, the environment, and the memories it is connected to must help create an intimate moment between them. And so, encouraged by this, Elvira proposes to Charles the notion of falling back in love. But instead of being passionate, Charles' eyes are full of sorrow. He breaks it to her then, they are living on different planes of existence, and her attempts to rekindle their relationship are futile. There's no future between them. After hearing this, Elvira quickly tries to touch his hands to feel their warmth, but her ghostly hands are unable to touch him anymore. The emotional connection between them must be fading. This hurts Elvira so much. There was a time when Charles vowed to love her forever, but obviously, he has forgotten every bit of his promise. In the next scene, as Charles arrives home, we understand how Elvira decided to cope with her sorrow through chaos, and vengeance. At first, a single plate falls from the roof behind his back, and once he goes out to check it, Elvira pushes the whole cabinet, full of dinnerware, down from the roof. Ruth arrives at the gates at that exact moment and screams at Charles, who manages to move away just in time. 
His arm, however, still suffers numerous deep cuts. In the next scene, Ruth takes care of the wounds and proposes her take on the events to Charles. To her mind, Elvira is trying to do one thing and one thing only, take Charles from Ruth and seize him forever by taking his life. She tried to murder him today. If Charles is a ghost too, there will be no more Ruth in his life, and thus Elvira will come out of the battle between women as a victor. Charles is dumbfounded. To his it all makes sense. Now he's afraid and horrified. If Elvira truly wants to end his life, at some point she will surely succeed in that endeavor. Quietly, they try to contact Madame Arcati, but the hotel says that she's gone, she checked out yesterday without any word. Yet Ruth and Charles must do something to create a safe space where Elvira won't be able to hurt them. That night, they removed every heavy and sharp object from the bathroom and closed themselves inside. There, after Ruth comes in with the typewriter, Charles admits that his script is already finished. He tells Ruth that he will take the text to the studio first thing in the morning. Ruth is over the moon. Now that the screenplay is done, they can fully concentrate on banishing Elvira from the living world. In the morning, the ringing of the telephone wakes Ruth up. She sneaks out and answers it. It's Madame Arcati, calling to inform them that she's ready to conduct the ritual and send the spirit back. Relieved that the end of Elvira is finally near, Ruth turns around and screams out in surprise. Edith is standing in front of her, scared and trembling as always. The ringing woke her up as well. Abruptly, Ruth asks her to tell Charles that she's out to fetch Madame Arcati and leaves. After a while, snoring leads Edith to the partially open door of the bathroom. Once she gets closer, suddenly she hears Charles pleading with someone not to hurt him. We see him with the knife that Elvira skates across his throat. Charles tries to assure her that he never stopped loving her and that he will immediately change the name on the script. But the cold steel keeps sliding on his flesh. Finally, he says that he'll get going right now. And Edith, who is hilariously sure that Mr. Condamine is addressing her, blurts out that Ruth is gone. Elvira gasps, and somehow we understand that she has done something terrible. Abruptly, the scene changes, and we see Ruth trying to use the brakes, but the car won't stop. The mechanism is ruined. Unable to do anything, Ruth wheels off from the road and suddenly realizes, to her that a cliff is waiting with its enormous jaws wide open. In the blink of an eye, the car drives over the cliff, and the sea consumes Ruth. Charles is standing sullenly in front of her lifeless body in the next scene. How could everything have gotten so out of hand? He struggles to avoid all the dread that come after the realization that Ruth is dead and he is at fault. People come to him to offer their condolences, but it's as if he's stuck between two worlds, living and dead. Suddenly, he sees Madame Arcati and approaches her. After a brief conversation in which they both blame themselves, Madame Arcati urges Charles to see her whenever he can, pays her condolences, and leaves. Suddenly, Charles hears Elvira telling him that he should rather be congratulated. Charles is infuriated, how can this woman still speak in such a proud and calm tone as if nothing of great importance has happened? Elvira even tries to convince Charles heartlessly that it was a pure accident. Charles should have been driving that car instead of Ruth. She has said enough. Charles' patience has run out. He takes a hammer and goes after her, screaming and cursing. The vain woman seems quite amused by this, and so they chase each other around the garden while the people are gathered in solemn silence inside the house. Suddenly, they see Charles running around the garden, swinging the hammer aimlessly in the air. Elvira leans on the window, and Charles swings right through her, breaking the glass. This has to stop, so Dr. Bradman runs from the house full of scared people and puts him to sleep. When Charles wakes up in the next scene, he finds himself tied to the bed. Restless to understand where he is, he asks out loud, and to his Elvira answers that he's in a loony bin. A bunch of doctors are looking at him from the window. He is informed that he is going to be held under close observation for 28 days, and in 15 minutes he's going to be carried away to have an electric shock treatment. Elvira also tells him that after all those events, she realizes now that she wants a divorce. Being stuck with a man in an asylum who mourns over his dead wife is a fate worse than death. Charles can't wait to make her wish come true, and he knows just the person to help them with that task. And so they escape in an ambulance car. While traveling, Elvira understands that it's good that her plan to end Charles' life didn't work out. She would have been stuck with this whiny man for eternity. Now she's eager to be banished from this world as well. Similarly, Charles contemplates how much of a fool he was for marrying this woman in the first place. Once they arrive, Madame Arcati welcomes Charles with her sweet and calm tone, promising that tonight the moon will provide them with extra power. The banishing ceremony is held in a cave, bright with candlelight and a silver moon. Madame Arcati tries many methods without success. Lastly, she puts something in the fire, and blazes it, and suddenly, the wrong door must have been opened, as Ruth appears out of nowhere. Charles, over the moon to see her again, tries to embrace her, but he goes right through her ghostly body. After that, Charles and Elvira explain to Ruth how she passed away. Elvira seems to like being so open, so she even tells Ruth about how she made love with Charles right beside her during that party and how, in truth, she wrote the whole script in place of him. 
And so, after Elvira tells Ruth all about his ill-doings, the two women finally agree on something. They both hate Charles, the self-obsessed man who only loves himself. Charles has no idea what to do next, so his feet take charge. He runs away, leaving Madame Arcadi alone to deal with Ruth and Elvira, who are quite amused by the notion that Charles thinks he can run away and hide. Finally, Madame Arcadi tries to banish them once more. Nothing changes for some time, but soon she sees Donald, her deceased husband, standing at the entrance of the cave. Her dream has come true, and all she ever wanted is finally within her grasp. Six months pass. Charles is in Hollywood, attending the shooting of the final scene of his film. The director seems to hate the last words, so he asks Condamine if he has something else. The last words were the only ones that he came up with, but he remembers how Elvira ended the story in the first place, so he tells the director. Naturally, the man loves it, and as he leaves, a journalist from the Los Angeles Times arrives. But instead of asking him about the way he wrote the story, she accuses him of being a serial plagiarist. Charles tries to contain himself, naturally, there's no way this woman knows how Elvira truly wrote it all. She must be bluffing. But sadly, she isn't. A man steps forward, holding the crime series written by Inspector Francisco Flores. As it turns out, Elvira planned it all. She made him rewrite those novels and call them his own. Suddenly, she appears in front of him, mocking and making fun of his demise. She even starts humming the song that used to be theirs. The song, Anger and Terror fill Charles's head, and he runs away in shock until he finds himself standing on the road while a black car, driven by Ruth, makes its way toward him. It hits him, the brakes squeal, and Charles swiftly stands up, screaming at Ruth that she almost took his life. But Ruth did take his life. Charles looks down at his own lifeless body, laying on the blacktop, and a terrible realization comes to him. This is how he'll be regarded as long as he's remembered, as a serial plagiarist. There's no one truly in love with him to call him back into the living world to give him another chance. 